Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming to this session. I, we have some amazing uh, practitioners of the arts here tonight, today, uh, and I want to uh, allow you to hear from them as soon as possible, get into it right away. So I thought I would have each of us, e each of our guests, um, introduce themselves briefly. And before going on to the next person, answer a, a question, the first of our questions, which is, um, Tell us about a rich source of inspiration for your own creative life, uh, a wellspring that you've returned to again and again. Let's start with Heather. Heather, could you tell us who you are, what you do, and then answer that question for us? Um, hello, everybody. Thank you for being here today. Thank you. Um, I'm Heather Watts. I was a principal dancer with the New York City Ballet for many years. Uh, I worked with and under and was mentored by George Balanchine, the Russian-born choreographer and founder of the New York City Ballet, um, and Jerome Robbins, American choreographer, a great Broadway choreographer and ballet choreographer. So I had the great fortune of um, working in a sort of golden age of ballet, if you will. And, uh, after I retired in 1995, I worked at Vanity Fair a magazine for Graydon Carter, where I was Bruce Weber, the photographer's editor, and, um, and handled arts and culture for the magazine. Uh, not exclusively was one of the editors. And uh, it was a real shock to leave, to leave dance and go into the real world. Mm -hmm. um, turns out the magazine world wasn't really the real world. Yeah. Uh, that came later. <laughs> I, um, I then, uh, well, I married to this guy, Damien, and uh, he was going to school in Cambridge, and while we were there, I reintroduced myself to the dance world, and uh, I've become a mentor and an educator and a teacher and a coach and a hand holder to uh, the widest range of dancers you can imagine, um, from the great dancers like Tyler Pack at the New York City Ballet, to the youngest beginning ballet dancers in college programs I teach around. I always say I teach around. Um, so I, I teach everywhere from Hunter to Harvard to wherever I'm invited. And um, in that range, to answer your question, and thank you for it, it's a very thoughtful one, I go into uh, my touchstone for my people, whether it's Tyler or a young college student who's devastated to have left her daily training and is always busy trying to convince me that she was really good before. Um, and I, I learned this from myself. I was always, I, you know, I wanted to tell them, oh, well, I used to be able to do this too. Mm -hmm. And I can't anymore, so from that point of view, uh, what I return to is a sense of self, a sense of personal best, where we are now, mm -hmm. and confidence uh, to find your own, to, to, to remember why we do it. Why are we dancing? Mm -hmm. You know, not looking in that mirror and hating, but rather looking beyond the mirror and... Mm -hmm. Not in, a, not in a teenage, childish way, in a grown-up way, facing what drove us to work that hard to tell a story without words mm. and without a story. Because Balanchine's ballets were incredibly abstract, most of them. And so to tell that story without a story and without words took an incredible amount of training. And so that's in a word, what I try to do. Next. That's, that's lovely. Thank you, Heather. Damien. Uh, Damien Wetzel. Uh, so I was uh, also fortunate enough to dance with the New York City Ballet for many years as principal dancer. Uh, in the middle of my career, I started adding on to that, uh, becoming someone who went to things like this uh, and other things and tended to be the kind of the artist voice in conversations. I ended up going to the Kennedy School and getting a degree in public policy. Uh, led me to the Aspen Institute under this incredible co-leader of this, Walter Isaacson. Uh, all the while still working in dance and music especially. 
uh, directing and producing, and I've been the president of the Juilliard School since 2018. Uh, I think your question is so provoking, actually, <laughs> because the pairing of like a life story and then what do you go back to is really clever. Uh, it makes us really kind of put it together and listening to Heather, it, it all it just actually adds up perfectly. Uh, what, I, what I left out, I guess, is that I grew up in a family that uh, I studied dance, I have studied some music, was not meant to be a dancer, that was supposed to be you know, part of an overall education. I uh, did not go to college. I was in the New York City Valley by the time I turned 18. Uh, and what it added up to was being that person who in the middle of a career that kind of got to the place that was the destination went, okay, and what else? Uh, I need to take this somewhere else. There's always got to be something else. Um, and when I think about your question, I think, I think that's what I go back to. Mm. It's not enough simply to have developed the technique and the ability to do the dances. It's where are they fitting in and how do they add on and what, what can we overlap with to bring it to another place. And I think about that so much in terms of art in general and art making. So when I'm directing a project or producing or putting people together, which is a lot of what I do, is putting people together in different ways. It's always about what are these things going to do together that they can't do just by themselves. We've gotten you, you got you, now you've got you, and what are we going to do? And I think that was, has been kind of the through line. Mm. Wonderful, thank you. Courtney. Uh, my name is Courtney Bryan. I am a composer and pianist. Um, and I'm based here at Tulane. I'm the Albert and Linda Mintz uh, Professor of Music. Um, I, I think um, there's certain things I go back to all the time. I mean, I think about sounds of my church where I grew up, St. Luke's Episcopal Church, like the sounds of the bells and the organ and the, the type of music mm -hmm. we did in the Anglican church, uh, mostly Caribbean and folks from all over the, di the African diaspora. Um, but I think for this question, I'm thinking about my sisters a lot. Like I, I grew up with my, close to my sisters who were both visual artists and a lot of my like, what I go back to, there's certain things that are within myself, but I still rely on them a lot. Like we liked, we've always like talked about our creative ideas together um, growing up and whenever I was creating, they were in the next room creating something. So still like there's this chat where we're just kind of like just brainstorming and thinking about ideas. So I think really like my sisters is, is something that I, I rely a lot on just conversation with them about creative ideas. Mm. That's, that's lovely. Uh, Tracy. Um, I'm Tracy K. Smith. I'm a poet primarily. I also write nonfiction. Um, and I am a faculty member in English and African and African American Studies at Harvard. And I do love this um, notion of going back because you're right, there's a kind of continuity. Um, and so I'll say that I started writing poetry um, 30 some years ago and always said to myself, I'm really interested in what I can hear beyond what I know beyond what I know to be my own voice. Maybe it's my unconscious mind that I'm invested in. Um, and maybe it's, uh, hopefully it's other things, other, other beings and sources and souls. I was a student of the great poet Lucille Clifton when I was a, in grad school. And um, she often talked about her relationship with her deceased mother and her deceased husband um, and with voices beyond the human who were useful to her practice as a poet and as a, and as a human. Mm. And I would sit in her class and say, I hope that can happen for me. Um, mm. I, I was in her classroom the year after I lost my own mom, and so I was really thinking, I wish I could do that. I, don't, I need to learn how to talk to my mother. Um, but my, my poetry allowed me, at the very least, to think in a way that was willing to be intercepted. Um, but now, I find that something more vigorous and intentional is, is what I come back to, which is a meditative practice mm -hmm. that for me is relatively new and that is not about stilling the mind, but rather inviting a kind of dialogue with someone else. Um, and now that I'm sitting here thinking, where does that come from? Yes, Clifton, and but also I grew up in a family with wonderful storytellers. My mother in particular was somebody who could 
give us the voices of her aunts and uncles and the old, you know, the folk that she grew up with. Um, and so there was this delight um, that I always attach to the idea of these other voices and these other, these other lives that can be summoned simply by inflection and, and um, anecdote. Um, and I think that might be a part of what I'm seeking. I feel that the, over the last several difficult years in the world, um, meditation has also been for me a way of coming into um, contact with ancestors um, and feeling um, like what they're saying is, we are still here and we, we too are working on this project of liberation. We're working with you and so you can trust that what you're doing is, um, is meaningful. Um, and that's been life-saving over these last, you know, for me it, it was 2020 when I realized, oh, I'm not, um, I'm not safe in the ways that I believed I was. And we, you know, the, the more I dwell in that, the we of, of all of us are not safe in the ways that we were, we were encouraged to believe. And so to imagine that there are these allies beyond time and space who are also invested in some of the very same things has been really grounding and sustaining. I love that. Wow, thank you, that was, that was profound. Um, I don't know about you guys, I love hearing artists and creators talk shop, you know, so I'd love to get kind of into the nitty gritty of the creative process. Um, I'm going to start with you, Damien, and I, I'm going to ask this question to, to all of you, but um, when you're beginning a creative project, uh, are there intentions that you set or actions that you take that help you get that project off the ground? And it would be great if you can think of a particular project and how you started it. I'd love to hear about that. I'm just so excited to have these conversations. What you just said, that speaking with the ancestors, I think is, and how it relates to being in Lucille Clifton's class is just incredible. And I think that that to me is already a gateway to possibility. Just uh, to thinking about your question, the practices of what one does when one starts a project. So uh, fair, fairness uh, in this is uh, she shared some questions with us, and this is one of them. And I had glib answers for each of them, I realized. <laughs> and the, the glib answer to that one is a deadline. <laughs> a deadline, yes. The way to get it started is to have a deadline, otherwise it just never does. And I have a project I've had brewing for a number of years now that does not have a deadline, and I, I'm <laughs> thinking, okay, answer your own question, put a deadline on it. In, in, once you have the deadline, uh, I suppose it has to do with um, what I think of as uh, kind of an Iron Chef model of like assembling ingredients and trying to figure out, you know, what those ingredients are gets you off the ground and then having the, the temerity in some cases or at least just the opportunity to ask people to be involved in something that uh, has a certain element of risk. Hmm. Very little of what I do is not involved in some way with risk. It's usually about asking somebody to do something that's slightly out of their comfort zone, something working with somebody new and in being introduced to something that is not just linear. Uh, and that's been, to some degree, uh, Heather and I were once told by uh, a colleague, friend, well, you guys make your own universe, uh, which is to say that we weren't just working within a system. Um, there's a, we have a dance festival we run, it's sort of outside, and it's thought of, oh, it goes over there, happen, whatever happens over there. Mm -hmm. uh, so it tends to live up to that to the best of its ability. So I think it's about assembling ingredients that are in many cases somewhat unlikely, mm -hmm. or first time at least, mm -hmm. uh, and then creating a challenge that uh, has a deadline attached to it. Let's make something together for this. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's been what excites me. It's what gets me interested uh, in a project. Uh, and if there's one specific aspect within that, it's always music. That music, it comes back to music in some way uh, and an exploration of, uh, I don't know, it's like just what makes you listen. That's wonderful, thank you. Courtney, how about your beginnings? Yeah, I mean, it really depends on the projects. There's always some like technical aspects of music that I'm working through and um, things I'm interested, like with notation, perhaps, like how do I notate these different ideas or like these different feelings onto a musical score. Um, there's um, 
I get inspired by things like um, numerology or like different, um, different like mathematical things, like loosely mathematical, but like kind of things that are like an abstract inspiration for me. Um, there's also, because I, I f find a lot of my time is like being in conversation with um, scholars in a lot of different fields. And so like learning about um, different ways of thinking and like different themes, or, or I'm very affected by, you know, like the world around me, of course. And so like, Sometimes those themes are in the forefront, um, different social issues, um, sometimes that's in the forefront. Throughout all of my work, like my spirituality is, um, is an inspiration, so that's always kind of like at the foundation of whatever I'm thinking about. So it just depends on the project, but I always kind of think of it on those different like, there's like, I know it's all connected, but like the mind, heart, and spirit, and depending on the project, one of them might be kind of more in the forefront, the way I'm thinking about it. Um, um, but, um, and when I think about the spirit part, it's kind of, that's the part that I don't control so much. <laughs> as far as I'm thinking about just inspiration, it's like sometimes things might really kind of hit me a certain way and I'm really like, feel like those things are a blessing. And other times it's kind of, um, other times, even though that's present, it might be more like, even if I'm not feeling that sort of inspiration in such a like overwhelming way, I'm always inspired by like some sort of problem that I'm working out artistically. So it just kind of depends. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Tracy, how do you um, start? Well, I like that you ended up with the idea of a problem because I feel like that's kind of, that's often where my poems begin. What's, uh, what is not right? What's nagging or itching or worrying me. Mm -hmm. And um, that allows me to be honest about what I'm, you know, what I'm in the thick of, what hap is happening in the world around us. Um, but more and more I find myself um, agreeing to do projects that aren't p books of poems, um, which is a very exciting and also extremely terrifying <laughs> mm -hmm. proposal for me every single time. Um, and I think that in some ways, there's a kind of um, liberation that comes from feeling like I'm a stranger in an area or I'm approaching a project that I don't know how to make happen and I can, um, I can struggle and move towards something that might be a useful mode. Um, I'm really in that place right now, trying to write a book that I, that's overdue. Deadlines <laughs> don't always work. Um, that was, came about from something I was thinking about years ago. That is a very different question in this, the world now, you know, X number of years later. And so I find myself paralyzed. Like, how do I, I keep starting in it, it's wrong. Mm -hmm. I keep moving toward what I think it's supposed to be and having that affirmed to be wrong for me because I'm un, at home in it or unwilling to sit down with it. So, mm -hmm. yeah, I don't know, I think, I think becoming almost a collaborator with that feeling of the very real possibility of failure <laughs> mm -hmm. is a big part of mm -hmm. um, somehow what I keep choosing in my, mm -hmm. in my work. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Heather, how about you? Hi, Melissa. Mm -hmm. I was thinking here, um, those are such, everything keeps going back to who we really are. Mm -hmm. And, um, mm -hmm. and I, I loved, when I was dancing, I loved the fear. I loved being scared. I loved getting dizzy. Um, I loved turning upside down and coming around and not being able to see the audience and having to dance. Mm -hmm. And I, I still do. So I have the great luxury, um, like with your questions, you emailed them to us. And the, Damien told me they were beautiful. And mm -hmm. I looked at them briefly and then thought, no, no, I just want to scare myself because everybody will be better and everything, but I'm still going to have to do it. So I choose, I have the great luxury in my life of identifying young talent um, uh, to work with us in Vail or just for them or for me. And um, 
I like to think I'm healing them. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times people are hurt and that's why they're what they're trying to, to dance about, mm -hmm. you know, or trying to sing about or trying to play about. And at the highest level, I mean, I'm exposed to some of the greatest artists in the world. Um, that's wonderful to heal, but at any level, it's, so I have a collection of beautiful young people in my life who I, um, I watch. And I realize that's, you know, that's what happened to me. I was watched. I was a mess. I was a rebel. I was crazy. I wasn't, I wasn't disciplined. I came with a host of issues that weren't going to make a bun head. <laughs> and it didn't. But I got to dance, even though I wasn't a bunhead. And so being that person, my responsibility is to welcome, is to welcome and welcome and welcome ever more of the broken toys. Mm -hmm. And that's, so that's my MO. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, this theme that I'm going to ask about next, I think it's already come up a few times, that um, the creative life involves a lot of struggle, um, a lot of moments of being stuck or not knowing the way forward. Uh, I want to start with Courtney here. Um, have you found ways to, to, to get yourself moving forward when you're struggling, when, you're, when you've run into difficulty in the creative project? Yeah, I mean, it's such an important part of the creative process because there's always, like, for me, there's the initial, like, I'm excited by this, I'm excited <laughs> by that, I'm going to do this. And then you get into the nuts and bolts of it, and there's always like, can I do it? You know, like, do it, can I do what I want to do in this time frame so there are other deadlines and stuff? And even if there's not a deadline, just kind of like coming face to face with the step by step process and where you're trying to get. And I just have learned over time to kind of build that into my schedule of working, like mm. building the time for frustration. <laughs> because it's such a big part of it. I mean, especially if you're doing something new, if you kind of come up with a formula, you know how to replicate it. I mean, maybe even that, there's frustrating, it's frustration in it too. But usually if the idea is that you're always growing and you're trying to like figure out something new, there's going to be like moments of forward motion. There's going to be times to be stuck. And so I just try to practice like good self-care, you know, um, Mentally, like just reminding myself too, like I think the more experience too, like the more I've been doing certain things, I'm like, oh, this always comes up and you always get to where you, you know, to where you're gonna get to, so don't like stress about it, you know, like just like maybe take a break. Like maybe sometimes the impulse at, in those stuck moments is to like just try harder, but I've learned for me, that's usually the time to maybe step away. Mm. So maybe it's time to go for a walk, maybe it's time to call somebody or just like, just kind of <laughs> like get out of your head a bit. Um, but I just build in the stuck moments to it because I think it's a part of it. And, and even for projects that don't succeed, because I usually, the thing I was thinking, well, the project's going to succeed, you know, however I get there. But there are some times where projects don't succeed. Mm -hmm. And that's a part of the process, too, because some of my projects that haven't, like, gone to completion of where I, was, where I thought it was going to go, I still learned a lot about myself. And I'm thinking a lot about collaborative works in particular, where maybe I came in with, we might have talked about what we're doing, but we all kind of had a different idea about it. And so it's like, you're working, you're like figuring out, just like any relationship, you're figuring out stuff. And sometimes the project doesn't happen, but I usually learn a lot about myself and my values and like what's most important to me, how to communicate, you know, all of those things. Like everything's a learning process. So I think about I, th I think about that along the way. But yeah, I just kind of like know when to push for it, know when to step away and just kind of like know how to be kind to yourself you know? mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and kind to others. <laughs> <laughs> Tracy, what have you learned about dealing with struggle? Um, I find that I am most in struggle when I'm trying to operate on what I've already learned how to do, like when I'm putting too much emphasis on what I think I know how to do. And inevitably, that means I'm writing, I'm writing the poems from the last book that's already done, <laughs> or I'm recapitulating something that is over or that has ideally should, should have led to something else. So I, I have to sort of, um, when I'm really stuck, I have to just turn toward a body of interest or knowledge that I can just learn about mm. um, and become a student of something. When I had my first very, very long, 
painful experience of writer's block many years ago, I just um, decided instead of trying and trying and failing to to make marks on the page, I would take a take a photography class. And so I spent a season, you know, in a dark room back in the day and walking around with a camera and learning to see images hmm. that told stories or that um, captured sort of emotional um, tone. And eventually those became tools that could live in the language, you know, that mm -hmm. I was writing. Mm -hmm. um, and now, because I'm having so much trouble with this book that I can't <laughs> figure out how to write, um, I'm trying to learn about consciousness and, you know, mm -hmm. like the practice of people who, who have a masterly way with energy and, and um, maybe that will help me write the book or maybe it will just make me um, braver in, in this other in this other context in life. Hmm. That's wonderful. Heather, what have you learned to do when you're stuck? Mm -hmm. I uh, doesn't actually pertain. I, for, for, for many years, I, I also I taught academically about balancing. Um, and in scary circumstances, I'm a high school dropout. So teaching at these illustrious universities was very uh, exhilarating and scary. I like the scary part, but it was also very intimidating. And so one of the things I learned to do was um, just do the work like I did in dance. Like you do your tondus, you do your plies, and that's how you get through the Nutcracker Potida. You know, you, you start doing plies. So I just would do the work and then just dive into it, stand there like I, you know, I saw movies of college professors. So I was like, okay, now I'm a college professor. And people would say, Professor Watts, and I would go home and I'd say to Damien, you can't believe it, they called me Professor Watts. And, you know, it was like really incredible to me. So it was like, I guess what I've learned to do is just act my way into every situation, but by being prepared. Like, not relentlessly prepared, because I'm not that person, mm -hmm. but like really thoughtful, really believe for the, for the people that you're working to reach that you have something you want to tell them. That's mm -hmm. what my solution. Mm -hmm. and, and he's helped me a lot, <laughs> because he is more disciplined. Mm. Well, let's hear from Damien. What do you do when you're stuck? Glib answer number two, <laughs> deadline, same. <laughs> Make a deadline. Uh, I'd also say talk to Heather because mm -hmm. I'm a terrible procrastinator. If I can wait, I will. Mm -hmm. If I, I know that about myself, that I wait for something else to happen, something else to emerge that'll make it happen. But in the end, it's, it is to go in and start doing the work. Um, in the end, that's really what it comes down to is having the wherewithal to begin, to get in a room, to get somebody else there. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, I have a sense of wonder about it a little bit. Like, I can't believe it. Like, the most, I'm gonna tell the story about, about mm -hmm. Taishan for a minute. Because you don't know how people are gonna do what. And so one of the tools, if there's a tool in this answer, it's, you know, kind of create some version of a pyramid scam. Get one person on board, <laughs> but then you can tell the next person, oh, you know what? This person's going to do it. You should come too. And we're going to have. It's going to be really great, and it and it's worked over and over again in different ways. But sometimes you don't know how it's going to end up. And so, uh, a couple of years ago, I really wanted to work with the choreographer Jamar Roberts. Jamar is somebody who is a star dancer at Alvin Ailey. I'd known him since years and years. He'd, we'd been on the stage together, even you know, when I was still dancing. So we knew each other for many years. But in the last years, he's become this amazing choreographer. And I wanted him to come to Vail and make a ballet for us. And it's unusual circumstances, like I said. It's like not normal. Uh, so I thought, what's going to appeal to Jamar about this? He's like, and so I thought, I know. I have this amazing commission lined up with this composer, Taishan Sori, who's incredible. And I'll tell Jamar, if you come, you can do a ballet to Taishan's piece. And sure enough, that actually worked, and it was great. Uh, but then I got this piece from Taishan for it, because the music wasn't done yet. It was also a commission. And it was called For Courtney Bryant. <laughs> uh, and 
<laughs> it was just incredible then when this sort of thing came together and I realized we were going to sit next to each other to realize you don't know how things are going to come out. You have <laughs> no idea. I didn't know I was going to be a dancer. It was something I did on Saturday mornings. And literally, one Saturday morning, my brother and I were on our way to various lessons. Among them were Chinese lessons. And he said, I'm not going to ballet anymore. And I said, great, I'm not going to Chinese anymore. <laughs> I became a ballet dancer. He's lived in China for the last 35 years. <laughs> um, get, in the, get in the room. That's the one thing. It's like, if you can get in the room. And if you can find people who have a sense of love of something, like I'm fortunate enough to work a lot um, with John Batiste in different ways. He gets mentioned. He's, spoken about as a New Orleans, son of New Orleans, but you know, when John sits at a piano and he just puts his fingers on the keys and he, he does what I did a minute ago, and I remember sending a video to my friend, the composer Caroline Shaw, and she just wrote back and said, he loves music. Mm. It's just like, oh my God, what a gift to be in a room with someone who loves something that much, and if you can get that pyramid scam going. <laughs> That's great. Um, the next thing I want to ask about is the fact that everybody on this stage is not only a practitioner, not only a creator, but also a teacher or a mentor to younger uh, creators and artists. And I, I, want, I wanted to ask each of you, I want to start with Tracy, um, what challenges do you see the, your students, your younger, the younger artists in your life wrestling with? And how are you able to help them as a, you know, somewhat more experienced and, you know, I don't want to say grizzled veteran or anything, but, you know, someone who's, who's been doing this for a while? Um, well, first I'll say that I am always so um, deeply moved by how much conscience my students are bringing to the art making table. So they're... Um, doing academic work in a range of fields and disciplines, um, not just English, which, which used to mostly be the case when I first started teaching. Um, and so they're thinking about how their practice as poets can help them um, synthesize this other knowledge or these other commitments in, in a new way and, and become you know, like helpful to earth and people. And I, I, I feel so grateful and inspired by and also like um, chastened by them. I wanna, I wanna make sure that that's what I'm doing too. Mm. Um, but I had a visit in a workshop just um, a couple weeks ago from a visual artist uh, who's an, a dear friend of mine. Her name is Melissa McGill. She does large scale public installation um, work and oftentimes um, that has to do with water. Um, and she brought in some exercises that were not rooted in language. My students were listening to sounds and mark making. Um, and we were sitting there watching. We were, I was kind of mark making too, but after a moment I looked up and I saw this. It was almost like beatific. They were, I don't know, there was a kind of childhood in the room with them. And so afterwards we said, what, what happened for you? And they said, Several of them said, I was released from the anxiety of impressing people for a mm. little while. Mm. Mm. I didn't have to figure out how to make something that was going to be successful. And I didn't have to, um, have to reinvent myself as an artist. How sad is that? They're like 20. Yeah. <laughs> reinvent myself so that they can get the reaction from the room. Um, and so I think what they are, are desperately in need of is the kind of privacy that many of us had when we were beginning mm -hmm. um, to become artists, where mm -hmm. nobody was watching, nobody knew we were or what we were doing, um, and there were no deadlines, there was no um, audience um, waiting, and you know, phone just went off. That's the audience mm -hmm. for most of us, right? Mm -hmm. This public mm -hmm. that we can tell ourselves is interested in what we post and, and like and say and profess. So I feel like maybe um, what I'm invested in bringing them are opportunities for silence, mm -hmm. opportunities for um, privacy, to build a framework for privacy within the poem you're gonna write for this week. It doesn't even have to be larger than that. Um, and something that in my imagination is an analog 
practice, you know, it's, it's not mm -hmm. um, connected to a network of, of um, signals and sensors or even, you know, viewers or readers just yet. Um, and that really allows for the need that I think art comes from to be felt and heated in a way. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, that's something I'm trying to bring new um, opportunities for, for them. Mm. Privacy, love that. Um, Heather, how do you find yourself helping students? Uh, I hope to help them in understanding that there's a thousand ways to get to heaven. <laughs> uh, you know, like a million ways, because there is a lot of, um, uh, and maybe, and certainly, and this is small bore, this is probably just to do with ballet, maybe. But what I, a lot of what I do is, 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 is re-plowing the same field. And having worked with a living choreographer on those pieces, let's say take Balanchine's Agon, um, reinvesting in it without him here, they, the young dancers of today seem to believe there's like a right way to do it. Um, and of course there is in some ways, but in the imperceptible ways, it's the, ex it's the, elasticity and the, and the you-ness of it. It's, what do you have? Because it's actually, you know, he'd, Balanchine would walk in the room, he'd put up his sleeves and he'd say, okay, let's begin. And he was starting anew that day with new clay, right? Like, now it's gonna be different, but it's gonna be the same, but it's gonna be different because of you. And so what can you bring to it? And not, not pretentiously, but what do you bring to it? What, the shape of your ears, the color of your hair, the length of your eyelashes, like what are you bringing to this? Hmm. And um, it's not as easy for today's generation to um, be free in their imagination to because they think there's a right way. Mm. They've, been, they've been taking an awful lot of tests, <laughs> you know? Right. And uh, they believe that there's good and bad and achievable. And to, to live in the circus, <laughs> uh, mm. there's no right. Mm. It's a crazy, there's bearded ladies and <laughs> scary people and <laughs> clowns and there's just like, all this stuff at the circus. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're entertainers. We gotta bring the, we gotta bring the show, man, you know? Mm -hmm. So that's what I, I try to get them to bring the show. Mm. So. Love that. Damien, what are your thoughts? I would, <clears throat> I'd build off that just to say that giving a sense of, getting a sense of perspective is something I keep coming back to with younger people. And some of it is, bewildering, to be honest, like thinking about what Tracy said. So I mentioned I didn't go to college. Well, when I was 18, I tried. I tried to go to Fordham on Mondays. Mm -hmm. uh, and the truth is, I couldn't do it. I was way too in my world. It was our only day off. And I got an incomplete, which came back to haunt me when I applied at Kennedy School. But uh, <laughs> it worked out. Dr. Wasserman wrote a note. Said he did it well when he came, uh, basically. Uh, Today's dancers, I read the other day, one dancer, she's got an MBA. And she's like a soloist, she's like 28. I was like, how, the, how do these people do this? Yeah, I know, I it's have no idea, they have all these things. And yet, I find perspective is somehow narrower than I would hope. Knowledge about the ancestors, knowledge about what the sense of possibilities are. Certainly, I mean, God knows that, that idea of doing it right. And I see that a lot, certainly, in, uh, you know, Juilliard is like, you're rewarded for being narrow by getting into Juilliard. Then you arrive and we're like, okay, well, widen up. Because, you know, the actual thing is actually connecting. The whole point is to connect. And if you don't have perspective, it's gonna be very hard to connect. You, you know, connect with people, connect with an audience, connect with one person. It's not that we do it our, for ourselves. It's a, something about it that has to have a respect for the perspective, perspe respect for the, the wonder of it, of overlapping with other things. So I, when I talk to young people, it's often about not just being focused on getting it right, certainly, or even uh, 
doing something well, but how is it going to connect and how, what, are you, what are you trying to say? Where are you oscillating from to where and how to open your aperture a little bit more than it maybe mm. currently is? Mm -hmm. That's beautiful. Courtney, how about you? Yeah. Um, no, all of this. I mean, it's interesting how every, every generation is different, like how they, how they relate to the classroom or to their craft and different things. Um, it's interesting for me. I mean, for this generation, um, they take such a leadership in a lot of what's going on in the world. You know, they're leading the protests, um, dealing with uh, Palestinian rights and dealing with climate change, dealing with reproductive rights. It's like, I don't know, it's like, it's interesting with this generation, like the, the things that they're dealing with, but also like when they're coming into a lesson or like, you know, like how to channel things, like how to talk, that balance between the head, the heart and spirit, like you're focused on very practical things, but also trying to go from what, where they're coming from, like where their mind is or, um, and some things that, um, and with the anxiety part, they're so used to social media and like everything being so public and they're thinking a lot about branding themselves. I'm like, well, before you get into the, uh, the branding and business stuff, just like, let's talk about these scales and stuff. <laughs> 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 you know, cause I, I just try to reassure them and you know, like for anybody, whether it's John Baptiste, who everybody knows, like there's, I, I, I mean, cause we grew up with the same teachers and stuff. Like there's a lot of time spent on that craft. So you don't know like, which way it'll go and um, think about teachers. So like we shared teachers, John Baptiste and Tyshawn Sori and I both um, were blessed to study with George Lewis at Columbia. Um, I find myself when I'm working with students echoing the, the, the professors and like sometimes it just comes out I'm like, oh, that was, that was this person, that was that person. Mm -hmm. um, but like so much great wisdom. One of my teachers that I really echo a lot is um, Kid Jordan who I studied with growing up in New Orleans. And he, um, he always talked about fundamentals. Now he's one of the most experimental I mean, he just recently passed last year, but like this music that's like really out of this world and um, all this, like I was very inspired by his music itself. I like that he didn't teach style, he taught fundamentals. So like how to play your instrument. And I mean, that goes to whatever you're doing, whether it's an instrument or writing or anything else. Um, and so I, I think about that and then I, I've been so interested in this creative process and I'm learning a lot tonight. Um, I started a class called Creative Process here at Tulane where it's, it's geared towards master's uh, MFA students in different fields, or, or master's students, but also we have some undergrads. But just trying to get into that creative process, you know, like a lot of the classes are about how to produce something, but I'm just like, how can we get into like these conversations like we're having today and stuff and, and just learn from people in a range of different fields and mm. different areas. Like we might all say a word like improvisation, but what does that mean to everybody? Or like we might say, energy and what does that mean, you know, I don't know, whatever the words are. So I just, um, so yeah, I, I really get a lot out of teaching. I find myself learning more from my teachers as I'm teaching other students, you know, it's just like a cyclical thing. Yes, yes. Well, I'm sorry, I didn't end up leaving us enough time for questions. I, I um, we have just a few seconds left. I thought we might do a speed round, a quick answer from each of you because when I asked that first question about a, a source of inspiration for you all, I loved your answers, but I had been expecting a, 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 the work of a particular artist or a choreographer or a musician. So I wonder if we could just very quickly, starting with Heather, mention one work that is a source of enduring inspiration to you that, that maybe some of the rest of us might enjoy. From my field? Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Um, well, I already did it. It was Agon. Mm -hmm. uh, it's Stravinsky Balanchine, choreographed in 1957. It's like modernist, looks like it was choreographed tomorrow. Um, and I, I could, I, I can, I have spent my life immersed in it. And I just wanted to say, I loved what you said, Courtney, about our teachers because I just suddenly needed to go. And Stanley Williams, my teacher. <laughs> so thank you for that. Wonderful, thanks. Damien. Wow, yes. I, I, I too have learned so much listening here. And uh, you know, that's really a hard question because I love so many things. Mm -hmm. You know, if I think about some things I come back to, I think about ballets I danced, like when she said Agon, I instantly thought about uh, Balanchine's Prodigal Son, which for me, it was the last ballet I ever danced, and it's a parable, and it has so much in it that relates to what I consider uh, communication through movement. 
I thought about West Side Story. I thought about things I, I experienced. But honestly, I want to say, I'll talk about what right now. Um, and it really is about like harmony in a way. And I think that relates to looking for something, mm -hmm. actually. Like I find harmony to be about reconciliation and some way forward. And uh, there's a composer I mentioned, Caroline Shaw, who I work with. And I'm not going to say one piece in particular, but I go to her music and I just, there's something in it that I just go, yes, that's where it is. So I'd recommend listening to Caroline's music. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Um, usually if I'm traveling somewhere for a while and I know I'm near a piano, I, I carry like books of Scott, Joplin, Scott Joplin's ragtime pieces and mm -hmm. Frederick Chopin's Nocturnes. Mm -hmm. And those are two composers I learned about early that I really connected with. And so I kind of carry those around with me. And I think musically, like the spirituals that I grew up hearing uh, when I was younger, it's always like something that's very deep to me. And I find it, even if I'm not thinking about it consciously in my work, like you can hear elements of that. So, so, so those are some of the, um, some of the things I go to. I love that. Um, I started mentioning Lucille Clifton, so maybe I'll just say her book, Mercy, um, one of her la last books um, is a really wonderful introduction to the cosmic, her, her cosmic dimensions of her imagination, which run through her work. But that, that book includes a poem called The Me Message from the Ones, received in the late 1970s. And that was a poem that she would talk about in class. And there were these um, basically conversations that she felt herself to be in the midst of or receiving with these um, presences that were like, we have a very important message for humankind. <laughs> um, and it's a, another vocabulary for the powerful accountability that her poems invite us to embrace. So, mercy, wonderful book. Yeah. That's wonderful. Well, I, I think you'll all agree this was an incredibly rich and deep conversation, and I want to thank all the participants for, for taking part in it, and I want to lead a round of applause for them today. Thank you. Thank you. Wonderful question.